for their 186th episode talking about epic metal live albums, the most outrageous metal podcast in the world, the 80s Glam Metal Cast. Ryan, welcome to the show, brother. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me again. Hey, no problem, man. We're going to do live albums. I can't believe that we've waited this long. It's, it's surprising me. I know. I, I totally agree. I, when we come up with these concepts, like I go, man, I wonder if he's done this and I missed it or something. <laughs> but uh, no, this is this is an entertaining one for sure. So the question is, man, are there really a lot of good live metal albums? Well, and what makes a good one? What do you think? Mm, I think, dude, like I chose the live ones I did because they're all from the era in which I dig these bands the most. So there's really just one from the 2000s, but the one from the 2000s totally harks back to the heyday. Like, like they knew how to stay in their lane and play what the people wanted. So, but it's killing to hear the epicness of their of these bands at their peak. And like, you know, we can argue all day about studio doctoring post. Oh live recording which i'm sure most of them are guilty of but yeah. whatever you know i still love it but uh you know i was also thinking about how live albums and videos have always been kind of like the line of professionalism and legitimacy in how i perceive these bands and it's like oh just for instance you know the crocus guy i'll throw on a crocus video from 83 and i'll watch mark Storacci and i know the notes coming and i'm like here it is he ain't gonna do it in he got it holy moly he nailed it you know so it's like this really really means a lot when they can do pretty much what the album told me they can do <laughs> yeah man I'm, i gotta be honest i'm not a huge fan of them i mean there's some that i really love and there's others i don't care for i, I look at it like in the 80s people put a lot into it and that's where i think a lot of the overdubs and all that shit came from I think in the 90s, it was just kind of like a low buck way to just kind of like cash in and bands just put them out as is. And, and I think there's there's some you know charm to something like that, but I don't care for it. I'd rather hear the studio version if you're just going to put yeah. out kind of like a shitty live version. But for me, man, I don't know about you, but I'm the mine, I'm always looking for something different, something special. A different band member is on this one. You know, just something unique about it. So it makes it different than the studio album. I'm always looking for that special sauce. Yeah, and some of these have that. Like, you look at, like, Dio likes to alter things, you know, like in, right. uh, I think it's Last in Line, uh, in, instead of just going, we would never, never, never come home. He does the, never, 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 and just keeps going on with the word <laughs> never, and you're like, oh, that worked out well. I like that. So, just little things like that I totally pick up on, too. And we got a big announcement that you and I have, have joined forces to make some music together. We got a project called Metalcast, appropriately yeah. named. And our first track <laughs> is going to be Heavy Metal Rambo. And we're going to premiere it midway through this podcast. Is that exciting or what? Oh, dude, I think so. I love the song. I'll be honest. You really did a great job. You, you came to me with this idea and this killer music written and, and lyrics, and we kind of joined forces on the lyrics and yep. whatnot. But, man, I really like it. I think it's a really cool song. And when you get a song stuck in your head and you've only heard it once or twice, that's kind of the true test of a, a quality song. And <laughs> I'm, not, you know, I, I'm not sitting here preaching myself or anything like that. I'm just saying I think it's a really cool song, whether I'm on it or not. <laughs> cool, man. I, I like it a lot, too. The census from everybody who's heard it is that it's wicked catchy, and and we know. I mean, you got to know. Coming from us, it's going to be very '80s. So I think everybody's going to dig it. And the subject matter, man, it's all about '80s action heroes, '80s vigilantes. So it's it's right up. Uh, I think everybody's alley here that listens to this show. Perfect, perfect, great explanation. <laughs> all right, so let's get into our list, man. I'm curious to see what you have and. Uh, and we can debate these things and go through them. What's your number 10? Very good, thanks. So I got a band that I think we've just merely referenced before but never really focused on. It's the band Thunder. And they released their Monsters of Rock Donington albums, uh, or I should say concerts, both in 90 and 92 in the last few years. Um, they were the underdogs, man. They were the local favorites who, from all the stories I've read, and, and I heard about this years ago, in 1990, they came in with their first album, 
And they kind of stole the show as the opening act at Donington. And that was a hell of a lineup that year. That was Whitesnake, Aerosmith, Poison, and the Choir Boys, who I don't know very well, to be honest. But, you know, the rest of them are hard-hitting dudes. So, anyway, this is a compilation of the, the first two appearances by them. I really like their first two studio albums and that that's kind of all I know, admittedly. I, I haven't really delved into the rest of their catalog, and they have a very extensive catalog. Uh, someday I'll get into it, but yeah, it's too much work for now. But uh, <laughs> they sound they, they sound great. They're very English, very straight ahead, kind of like a '80s bad company esque sound is what they were kind of going for, I think. So you know, you throw in like ACDC, uh, Bad Company, and then some like '80s influence, and you come up with Thunder's first two albums, and uh, they really did a good job. And if you delve into the Monsters of Rock kind of stories in each of those years from the heyday. A lot of people say, even audience members, that Thunder really stole the show. So I had to throw them on here for that reason. That's cool. I'm not a huge Thunder guy, and I don't even really know much about them. I think I know the song Dirty Love. Um, that's about it. So I'll have to check some of this out, man. Yeah, it kind of opened my eyes again to them being a pretty cool band. So number 10, and I think this is, we're going to have this theme with all mine. There's going to be something unique that I can't get anywhere else, and that's why I like these live albums. My number 10 is going to be Union, Live at the Galaxy. And if you know yeah. Union, maybe maybe you don't remember Union, but it was a pairing of John Karabi and Bruce Kulik, two of my favorite mm-hmm. bands, man. Kiss and Motley Crue references there, so, so that's cool. The great thing about this live album is you're getting songs from Carnival of Souls, you're getting Jungle, and you're getting I Walk Alone. And you're getting power to the people. Oh, sorry, not power to the people. That's John Lennon. Power to the music <laughs> from the, uh, the Motley '94 album. So that's the special sauce on this one. And you know, I'll admit it. I Union, I was never huge, huge into. I thought they were decent, but I was kind of expecting like they were going to sound kind of like if you mix Revenge and the Motley '94 album, and they they really didn't. They kind of were going for you know, of a more modern sound or whatever. So that's cool. You know, but like I said, I like to go back on that one. The songs by Union are cool. And I think John Krabi is just a great singer. And to get those cool different songs, because if you think about it, man, the Carnival of Souls album was like a shelved album. None of that was ever played live. And then after Krabi right. left Crew, they, they were never going to play any of those Motley 94 songs. So it's really the only place you're going to get this stuff. And it's a tight band. And when I talked to John... He said it was kind of a rush job because I think Cinderella was doing a live album and they were on tour with them. So they kind of just used mm-hmm. the same truck and recorded them. They didn't really get much of a sound check. It was just get out there and do it. And for what it is, it sounds really damn good. Oh, man, I can't wait to check that out because I remember buying that album when it first came out. excited about a, a new band with these kind of guys in it. Mm-hmm. And it's been a while since I've listened to their studio album, but it'd be really cool to, to hear this. So I'll, I'll have to dig that one up. Yeah, I think YouTube might be your only place to get it, but it's it's out there. I see. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number nine. Now you're okay. A repeat offender. Danger, danger. I got him doing uh, Live and Nude from 2005. It ain't Ted Poley. But that's okay, because I love Paul Lane, and I really appreciated the set list that they came up with. Um, I think we've talked about before, Danger, Danger, the first two albums without Ted Pulley would have been weird. Ted Pulley did a great job on those first two. But then when Paul Lane came in, you can't deny that, dude. In my opinion, I like them both. So I dig the fact that Paul Lane is a very professional singer, and he kills it on this thing. So... There's only two of the uh, songs from the quote-unquote newer albums, and that's Dead, Drunk, and Wasted and Grind, and they're actually both really good songs. So the rest is Danger, Danger, Heyday, Killerness. Uh, Beat the Bullet is my choice cut from Monkey Business, and they open with it, which is great. Two songs from Cockroach, which I love, are Going, Going, Gone and Good Time, both amazing rippers, and you can't deny Bang, Bang and Under the Gun. So these songs are sung note for note to perfection and 
performed very well. I don't know about the studio noise or the uh, audience noise. It kind of it might be piped in. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, it's a it's a decent crowd. Let's just say that. And uh, in 05, I don't know what kind of crowd they'd have fetched. So uh, I don't know if that's legit or not. But I don't care because it's a really killer album. <laughs> you know. I listen to a little bit of this, and it does sound pretty cool. And once again, what you're getting is you're getting to hear Paul sing on the albums, you know, songs from the albums that he wasn't on, and that's something different. So that's what makes that live album kind of cool. Yeah, there you go. There's some difference that we're talking about. Exactly. Okay, number nine. This is no shock that I would put these guys on a list. I put them on almost any list I I ever can. (laughs) But this is a weird album. Uh, This is a weird one. It never came out in the States. loudness and it's called loudest at budokan 91 okay now this thing got shelved so they recorded it in 91 and they shelved it because it maybe because of the changing times Viscera was out of the band and it just didn't go anywhere now it came out in 2009 in japan but you could only get it as an import only you can get most of this on youtube and i'll put the link to this in, in this video so you can check out some of this but this is like peak loudness, man. The band is just on fire. And one, once again, one of those cool things, you get to hear Mike Vissera do like Crazy Night and a lot of the songs from the original singer, and they sound killer. For me, he, it's kind of like an upgrade with him on there. You know what I mean? So it, yes. it sounds pretty damn good. But And here's another cool thing about this album. I had this on as a bootleg right way before 2009, before the actual uh, album came out. And you can tell it's, there's not a lot of overdubs because they all sound killer. So, and the only thing I think they do pipe in are backups. And you can understand that. I mean, the, the guys in Loudness are mostly speak Japanese. They're not going to be able to do harmonies on par with Mike Vissera's voice. You know what I mean? So I think they no, have pre-recorded no. backups, which is totally understandable. And, okay, very strange coincidence. Okay, the bootleg that I had was a double disc. And I'm not good with my CDs. Like, I don't keep them in cases and shit. They're just, like, in stacks. So... I knew there was something I wanted to reference on this, and I couldn't remember the specifics, okay? So I found okay. disc two the other day, and I listened to it. And I was like, okay, pretty cool. I couldn't find disc one. I wanted to find disc one because you know the song Never Again, the ballad that's on uh, uh, on the prowl? So they do that, mm, yeah, and at yeah. the very end, Mike Vissera does this piano thing where it's just him and the piano, and, and it's live. And what's cool is it became a song on one of his solo albums, and I believe that was called Fallen Tears. It ends up on like his um, animation solo album. So for the longest time, I couldn't remember what song he did. And now we're talking, this was like eight years prior to it coming out on a solo album. And I couldn't remember what it was. I couldn't find the disc. Now, don't I find it today just on a whim and I listen to it. <laughs> so it, once again, this is the most nerdy, rare thing that nobody on earth would ever know this probably but me but and, and maybe mike maybe mike Vissera doesn't even know this but, but, <laughs> but live he did play one of the solo songs like eight years before it came out so a cool fact but check this out man like i said the band is so tight he sounds killer it's just great stuff the only thing this some of this did trickle out like on compilations and things like that but uh for the most part this is just like an unusual one you're not going to find it at walmart or something it, it's it's super rare so <laughs> So it okay, is it an official release or a bootleg? It's an official release. Okay, got it. It, it came right, out cool. officially like on Warner Japan in two thousand nine, but you only it did, did not come out in America. You can only get it as an import. But what's like I said, it's very cool because you've got um, Vissera. Mo, most of the album is on the Prowl. It's mostly doing a lot of the on the Prowl songs. They do Soldier of Fortune, but then they do like SDI, Crazy Night, Crazy Doctor, Loudness. So lonely. So there are some ones from the original singer, and it just sounds cool with Mike doing those songs. So, dude, that's killer. I got to check that out because even when you sent me the the uh, Mike Becerra with uh, Ingve from '94, oh, that stuff. That's and good, you know, dude. dude, dude, that one is killer. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna check out this Loudness one because he and Loudness were such a good combination. They were. And then you're not you're not crazy when it comes to this stuff, dude. I pick up on this shit. So much too. So like the fact that you know the the ballad thing and it, it was re- released later on in his career is awesome. And I guarantee you that you know it and he may not, like you said. <laughs> well, you know what, man? Like we always say, 
I just really hope that like we expose this to some people and they discover it and they really realize how great it was because it just it didn't get enough publicity it wasn't promoted right but it was a really good time for the band and a really great uh, you know mashing of uh, musicians so yeah what's your number eight? Well, I kind of showed my hand earlier, but I got Dio, Donington, 1987. Mm -hmm. and, and again, Dio, 87, unfortunately, Bon Jovi was the headliner of this Monsters of Rock one. But you know what? When you got Slippery When Wet out, Ooh. you're going to be the headliner everywhere you go. So I got Bon Jovi, Dio, Metallica, Anthrax, Wasp, and Cinderella. Very, very killer lineup that there. Is. So... Man, those Monsters of Rock shows, Donington, were so good back then. But anyway, uh, to me, this is just Dio at his peak. Mid-80s Dio was so killer. Uh, and again, like I said, Monsters of Rock shows through the 80s and early 90s were so cool. The set list is a very decent reflection of his his career, including Sabbath and mm -hmm. you know some of his earlier things. So um, the only problem is I'd love to hear... Like we rock and like maybe a, a little bit more of last in line things because to me like that's the epitome of Dio solo. Um, but he just sounds amazing as usual. And although American, we might agree that Dio has a very European style. So sure. him at Donington did very well. And I bet you there were some European folks there or some UK folks there that were not that stoked on Jovi being the headliner, but you know what? They probably delivered too. So, yeah, that's it. That's it for this one. A couple thoughts. You know, I, I listen to some of this, and what I think is, you know, just kind of unique about these is these these are all coming out like years and years after they were ever recorded. You know what I mean? Where I would oh yeah, seen, totally. Like a, a whole album like this with D, like kind of like talking about using that '80s magic to make it sound really beefy and awesome, and even overdubbing. Yeah, dude, I got no problems with overdubs. I want to have that live experience, and I don't want it to sound like shit. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying Dio does, totally. but but you know we're gonna get to some other ones where you know there was some magic, some studio magic, but it enhances it. It makes it sound awesome. So I would love to have had like a full live album. I know Dio's got like Intermission, which was like an EP, but like the full straight on Dio live album with all the the fixins, you know, the big budget. That would have been cool. But but to have these, it's it's very cool stuff. Yeah, and it's pretty cool. Like recently, I was listening to a Dave Medicchetti interview. And um, Eddie Trunk was asking him about his warm-up routine because Medicchetti sounds very true to form every time he plays live. And they referenced Dio. And they were asking, you know, Dave, are you the guy that – are you like Ronnie James Dio who the first note you hear on stage is your warm-up? And that was – Dio was famous for that. He said, why waste a note? He's going to go out on stage – and his first note will be the one you hear. Hmm. And and that's pretty much shows what a talent Dio was and Dave Medichetti because he follows the same routine. But, dude, I, I got to say, like, like the, I don't think this guy needed any overdubs. <laughs> no. Okay. My number eight. Another sleepless night. Another band always comes up on a list. Sabotage Live '95. Uh, it's live in Japan. It's an official release. It wasn't it like a big time all over the place? And I don't know. Maybe maybe it really only came out overseas in '95, and then it got distributed later on. You know, as time went on. I'm not really sure. I got it later. You know, maybe in the 2000s. But anyways. Sounds phenomenal. Unfortunately, Chris Oliva has passed. Uh, probably should have did a live album when he was alive. Nobody obviously knew that he was going to pass away. So Alex Skolnick is on guitar. Zach Stevens just sounds killer. He, he, he's doing a great yeah. job. Mostly playing, as with the loudness, mostly playing songs from Handful of Rain. So there's a lot of that. But the cool little yep. thing that you get, that just again, just like the loudness that's different, is you get to hear Zach do some of John's songs. So you get to hear him on... 
uh, Sirens and Jesus Saves. Mm -hmm. And then what's cool about Gutter Ballet is they trade off lines. So John's in the band again at this point. So he's playing keyboard and rhythm. And on Gutter Ballet is one of the last songs they play. They, they trade off and go back and forth on uh, each on the verses. And then they sing the chorus together. It's awesome, man. It sounds so good. So very, very good recording. Maybe cleaned up. I don't know. But a great list. Totally. I like that one. Uh, they do the song Chance in there. Yeah. I think that song is Crazy to really... try to do that live, right? <laughs> Dude, yeah, that's such a good one. I was kind of shocked at the lack of um, the historical songs yes. in that set list on yes. this one. Same. But I know they I know what their focus was, which is totally appropriate at the time. But I was I was you know, there was missing some crucial songs for me on that one. Yeah, but what I just saw was when uh, the whole Sabotage catalog got re-released not that long ago. And it looks like they had a couple bonus tracks on here that should have probably been on the main release. And one of yeah. them was Hall of the Mountain King. I mean, come on. The original one, it's not on there. And um, I know. Was, I, think, I don't think it is. And then I looked, and there's two different songs. I can't remember what the other one was, but that Hall of the Mountain King. But, yeah, that should have been on the regular release, definitely. Agreed. Yeah, totally. All right, man. Number seven. She's a Got my boys Racer X doing Extreme Volume 1988. So this is another killer era for a ripping band. And Racer X is just peaking here in 88. So they have two live albums coming up in these couple of years. But I chose this one due to the set list. And you got Loud and Clear, Dangerous Love, Into the Night. And then each member gets a moment in the spotlight with their own solo. And this band was just made up of all-stars. Features, you know, Paul Gilbert coming up on some future Mr. Big fame. Scott Travis was some future priest fame. And then Bruce Boyette and John Aldretti went on to be members of The Scream with Karabi. So um, really cool band members, very talented guys, and really cool time frame for Racer X just to be shredding in the clubs in L.A. So I had to put it on here because, again, they are very true to form. I don't know about any studio magic because they're so talented, but I've always really liked this album. Yeah, I mean, Racer X just missed my radar. I, I do remember their albums like being advertised in like rock magazines. And I think part of the problem was, for, actually it was probably availability too, was that we kind of, you and I talked about this the other night, is that Shrapnel was kind of like the CMC of the 80s. You know what I mean? It was, like, oh, totally. it was kind yes, of like a exactly. low buck label. You know what I mean? So, yeah, and maybe that's why I stayed away. Because, you know, especially around that era when this stuff was coming out, I was into, like, the heavy hitters on the big labels. And so maybe that just, just was just too rare for me at, at that moment in time. I don't really don't know. Yeah, it's worth getting into, that's for sure. The craziest <laughs> shit, though, is that Jeff Martin, who was the singer, became the drummer of Badlands. That's still a head scratcher for me, so... Oh, I know. I thought it was such a common name. It couldn't be the same guy. <laughs> right? But it is. All right. Number seven. Nothing of the kind. There is no true escape. I'm watching all the time. I'm made of metal. My circuit's clean. I am perpetual. I keep the country clean. Now, the first time that priests related a live album to show up, on my, my uh, list, and I'm actually even surprised by that myself. But number seven, I got, you. Oh, speaking of CMC, Judas Priest, Meltdown 98, man. I love this live album. You know, it's just, it sounds incredible. It's heavier renditions at this point. They're, they're coming off a of jugulator, and they're, they're, they're doing all the songs real heavy. Uh, I mean, between the drumming, we just talked about, you just, actually you did, talk about Scott Travis. So his drumming on all these songs is just killer. Glenn and KK are just shredding, going crazy, chugging all the songs. And, of course, man, you got Tim Ripper Owens. And he just sounds so good. And what you got to give Tim credit because nowadays, and I'm not going to mention any band names, but a lot of people like to get copycats, okay? That some guy that sounds exactly like the guy they had before, and that's all fine and dandy. And I know Ripper was in a priest tribute, but he does not sound like Rob Halford to me. Does he... Does he fit the bill, right? Can he pull it off? Of course. But, man, there's just certain songs where he's got the heavier growl, a little bit nastier than Halford is, and it just works, man. So I've, I've always loved this live album. It's a double album, actually. Yeah, I'm so proud of you for putting that on there, man. That's a good one. I uh, 
I may have some priests coming up, but it ain't this one, but I'm stoked that you put that one on there because I love this album. Nice. All right. What do you got for six? I got Doc and Beast from the East from 88, and nice. this is the last effort from the golden era of Doc and, and start off by saying how very disappointed I am due to the omission of Burning Like a Flame from this album. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my only complaint here, but the rest is Doc and ripping killerness. I like how they formed the set list and they had a lot of heavy hitters up front with a Tooth and Nail and Kiss of Death. I, I wonder if they um, altered the, the, the I, I guess, the album tracks on the live album because they were opening with Kiss of Death on this tour, and they kind of continued to do so, but they have Tooth and Nail prior to Kiss of Death on this album. So I wonder if they kind of messed around with that, but we'll see. But at the top, you know, there's some hard-hitting stuff. Um very decent representation of their catalog. When Heaven Comes Down is a cool album track edition. I'd maybe have chosen something else, but it worked really well. And really cool album artwork. And it was just such a shame that it was the last offering for those guys from the golden era of Dokken. Yeah, you know, I bought this when it came out. Always enjoyed it, but I, I think it was one of those ones where I just would rather hear the studio version. I, I don't know why. this would, I never really connected with Beasts of these. And I don't know if it's maybe because maybe because Don just isn't that interesting of a person like on with the stage raps or something. You know what I mean? Sometimes like that, like there's always got to be that little thing that makes it for you. And I, nothing ever stood out for me with this album. So I'm sure there's people booing at their uh, their device right now. But I mean, <laughs> right. I, I went back and I listened to it because, you know, when I'm getting ready for this. And it, it sounds good, but just never really connected with it for some reason. Don't know why. Yeah, dude, I was going to, I think that, that my, like I said, my only, Bummer was the, the lack of burning like a flame, which I love. And they may have played it live and not put it on this album, which would have been awesome because I think that may have catapulted a little bit, bit higher because yeah. it's a very big song off that Back for the Attack, but whatever. <laughs> all, all right, man. I, I'm surprising myself. Another priest related live album for my number six. Halford Insurrection Live and when you talk about specialness it don't get any more special than this one because first of all Halford kind of came back to metal in the early 2000s so this is all him touring off his Resurrection uh, solo album or Halford band album however you want to put it but what's cool about it is you get that material which I thought was all stellar then you get songs from Fight which that's a nice little bonus and of course you get Judas Priest stuff so this is so good. He even does a Scorpion song. He does Blackout, and it sounds killer. So, oh wow! There's, I mean, I, and for me, like I always like, you know, I'm like you, you know, like I like Turbo and Ram It Down and stuff. But man, some of these songs, I like these better than the original versions, like Jawbreaker, Riding on the Wind, Tyrant. They just kick ass. And one thing we didn't talk a lot about yet, but we'll, we'll we will as we get going here. A lot of live albums have some studio tracks right <laughs> you didn't mention that yes. docket had a studio track just walk away right walk away um oh that's which, true which, yeah which is a cool song this ends with three killer songs screaming in the dark heart of a lion which you had said that came out by racer x and i guess originally oh, it, right. was a, yeah. it was a pre-song that didn't make turbo and then went, it went to racer x and then there's another song called prisoner in your eyes and i'm telling you all three of those tracks man are just so good so not only do you get all that great stuff uh, Helford doing all these different songs from his catalog, but then you, you end off with some uh, some killer new tracks too. So, and and, and kill he's on the top of his game on this, and he really is remaining on the top of his game for a long time. But he's he sounds real killer, dude. Killer putting this on there because I totally forgot about this album, and I think we had talked about this in one of the two thousands episodes, and 
and went to this package tour with Queensryche, Maiden, and Halford. And at the time, I was majorly into Priest and Queensryche. Queensryche absolutely played all their like really, really hard early, early stuff, and then a lot of like 90s and 2000s stuff, and really missed the mark. Maiden was cool because they were coming back with Dickinson. Yep. But Halford absolutely stole the show and killed it. And he played such a great set. And, dude, I, I'm stoked you put this on there because I'm going to create the shit out of this album now. Ah, I think it's doctored a little bit. I could be wrong. It sounds like way too good. But, uh, but what you know, I don't want to listen to something that sounds like shit. I want to get that vibe that it's live and it's different because you look at it. Usually... A live album is going to have a different kind of a drum sound and stuff like you know. So you want that kind of a vibe, but man, if you touch up some shit to make it sound good, I, I appreciate that. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to do the the latest Van Halen live offering. No, or leave, or it, leave Motley, it as is. <laughs> or Motley Crue's Entertainment or Death. You, you you might want to take Death for that one. But uh, oh anyways. boy, yeah. All that's right, true. Well, we pr- as promised, we get we're at the middle of the uh, podcast. We're gonna play heavy metal Rambo, so let's talk about it a little bit. So we got you, Ryan, on lead vocals, doing a great lead vocal. I'm on there playing some bass, a little bit of keyboards, throwing a little vocals here and there as well. We got our buddy Matthias. He's doing the lead guitar work, which is stellar, almost like in the vibe of George Lynch. And he uh, does the drum programming. I'm just going to be up front. It ain't real drums, but I think that's what makes it so cool and 80s-ish. Uh, hey, Ram It Down doesn't have real drums, man, and it sounds great. And, uh, and and we got our buddy Chad. He did a lot of the harmony vocals because what we were shooting for is we're trying to get that um, big Desmond Child chorus because there are some ties to Kane Roberts because Kane was always known as the heavy metal Rambo. So anything I'm missing you want to <laughs> say before we play this thing? Crank it, love it, realize that we know one thing, and that is to be 80s true metal rippers. <laughs>
everybody enjoyed that we were all banging our heads while it was going on i hope you did as well ryan any closing thoughts on heavy metal rambo dude i hope you like it it's a catchy song and it's gonna get stuck in your head yeah don't yeah don't try to sue us if you can't sleep tonight and all you hear is heavy metal rambo so, <laughs> uh, very good i love it all right well back to the list man what do you got for five Well, again, my boys ripping in 86. I got Crocus alive and screaming. <laughs> so they came off a real stinker and change of address that year, but they definitely redeemed themselves with the aggression of alive and screaming. And uh, mercifully, they only incorporated one song from change of address, and, it went, and the rest were classics. So they, they kind of, including the tune they should have released in 86 in the song, Lay Me Down off this album, which was a studio track, which was amazingly good. The great new track, I mean, that should have been on the, the, the headline spot on Change of Address, but whatever. Also with this, was this was recorded in the Texas Jam of 86. Way back during our Heavy Metal Wishlist podcast, I discussed the missing pro shot footage that exists somewhere out there that I'd love to see from the Texas Jam 86. There's YouTube MTV footage out there, snippets of a recorded show, and it's sitting on a shelf somewhere, and I'm going to find it. I promise you. <laughs> I'm going to email all the powers that be, all the radio stations that were in existence at the time, and see if it's in some VHS sitting in there somewhere. But I actually messaged Mark Storacci one time and said, where is this footage? I see there's MTV commercials and teaser footage of this. There's got to be cameras everywhere. It was a stadium show. Where is it? And he said, if you find it, you let me know. So there it is. If anybody's listening and knows where it is, let us know. Yeah. Man, it's, you never know, man. There's always something that gets unearthed. Being a KISS fan, and I think this I mentioned this before when you brought this up. I mean, there's shit that comes out that's 40 years old, maybe even older, that you just can't even believe that, that, that this hasn't been unearthed and it gets unearthed. So it could happen. Totally. I hope so. Well, I think this band was also there. You said Keel, right? And uh, that's that's my number five. And Keel, larger than live. And, and what makes it larger than live is it's half studio, half live. And uh, the first side is all studio stuff, which is really killer. I won't get into that too much because it's not technically live, but there's some great stuff on there like Evil, Wicked, Mean, and Nasty and uh, Die Fighting. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. But when you get to the second side, uh, it, it's gr all the whole album is great quality. It's produced by Ron Keel. He did a great job. Sounds really good. This album, something happened with the... Uh, the distribution so they weren't on mca anymore more but they still were a part of gold mountain so i don't know if it just didn't get out there as much you didn't see as much in, in the realm of videos or promotion for this album a lineup change happened here too so when you listen to the live stuff like mark ferrari's gone but brian jay's still there they added a keyboardist of scott warren uh, who went on to play with a lot of other uh, bands? I think he was in Warrant. Yeah, he everyone. Keyboard us, yeah. Then he played. I think he played with Dio. So you know, all, all those guys have been all over the place. But anyways, 
a new guy came in, um, which was uh, Tony Palmucci or something like that. So he mm-hmm. played on all the the uh, he played on all the studio stuff. So it, it's just a weird time for Keel. They they died after that. But what's nice about this is it, it's interesting. Now a lot of bands did this, which is weird, is they would have actually have some new studio tracks that they would play live. So there's some of that. You got Rock and Roll Animal. You got Rock and Roll Outlaw, which we talked about when we did the movie episode. This is the only place where you're going to get a Keel release that has uh, Rock and Roll Outlaw on it. And, of course, you do Right to Rock. And then you do A Cold Day in Hell, which is a Steeler song. So you got a lot of cool little things going on with this album. Weird time for Keel. And then, like I said, right after this came out, they pretty much broke up. But uh, they, they sound killer live. The keyboard actually adds a lot to it. And actually that was kind of a reason why Mark Ferrari wanted to be out of the band when Ron said, Hey, we're going to add a keyboardist. And uh, Mark was like, no, no, I don't think so. But I actually think uh, Ron was right. It actually sounded good. And when you think about it, it was kind of ahead of his time. Cause like we said, everybody had an offstage keyboardist uh, in the early nineties uh, and stuff like Warren and all those guys. So that's what I got, man. Larger than life. That's great. And it took me forever to find this album because it's not streaming anywhere other nope. than YouTube, but I finally got the CD, nice. and I was stoked I got it because it's so cool. Like even the album cover is kind of, you know, it's the half and half, half. thing, and kinda, it, it kind of paints the picture of what's going to happen when you listen to it. And it's a really great album, and the studio tracks are cool. I think they're really cool, actually. They're so really good. Very, very, very good to put out this album on there. You know what else? I'm glad you brought up the album cover because like there's half of it. That's black and white, yes. and half that's in color. Half the band members are on one side, and then then half of them are on the other side. And the picture always drove me crazy because the colored side is very dark, and you can't really make out who's who. So like, so you got this new band member, but you can't see him, and and, and it almost appears that he has short hair in the picture, but it's just because it's a terrible you know uh, lighting or whatever. But he does. I found up. I found a picture of Tony Palmucci one time, and he did have long hair. But it was like as a kid, that's the kind of stupid shit you'd obsess about. You're like, oh wait a minute, I, I want to see what this new guy looks like. Oh, he doesn't have long hair. So I'll just never forget. Like when you mentioned the album cover, I was always trying to make out who who's who because it wasn't like. Poison and Cinderella, where you knew everybody, you saw them twenty four seven in Metal Edge. Keel was a was a different kind of rock and roll animal. So, oh, nice. <laughs> All right, number four. Well, here's where I got White Snake doing Donington 1990, nice. and I'm stoked they put this thing out as an official release because a lot of people talk shit about these this concert for them, and it was well, we'll talk about it. But anyway, powerhouse band with a powerhouse set list is what I think. Okay, so people kind of bag on it, like I said, but I don't see anything that's wrong with it. I think the Euro crowd probably didn't really appreciate it because it was. They may not have accepted the new Americanized snake, but sure. I mean, I know you and I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the set list, the set list, and this harks back to what I talked about at the beginning. It's like a dream set list with tons of stuff from Slip of the Tongue and then the Rippers from '87. It's got good stuff from Slide It In. You know, they didn't focus on the old bluesy stuff. I really enjoy the set list, but the only thing I can say is there's no Children of the Night. But that's okay, because the video kills, as does the album. And I think that Steve Vai was a cool addition to the band. And even though I miss John Sykes, I dig this set list. I dig this show. I've seen the video several times. And I'm glad they finally released it. I like this show, too, because it's really the only chance to hear a decent sound you know, quality of this tour. But... There's a couple things, man. I kind of feel like Coverdale's voice is a little fried on this at times. You know what I'm talking about? Like, he's a little... Yeah. He's pretty raspy and, and really screechy at times. But the cool part about this, which is another one of those, we're talking about that special sauce, Steve Vai does two of his solo album songs. Yeah, that's and Warfare, right. Right? And uh, I think he does For the Love of God, and he does uh, The Audience is Listening. And it's just... That's exactly it's it. It's so cool. What a, what a cool thing. He's like the white snake band is backing them up and everything so so awesome man yeah so no it's a cool it's a cool timepiece to have from that tour yeah it's good 
Totally, I agree. All right, number four, they're back again. The priest is back at number four, but it's it's probably their best one, right? I mean, not, let's not let's not kid ourselves. Priest live is a freaking classic. It's pretty much how I oh, know yeah. most of these songs. This is how I first heard a lot of their songs was on this album. And MTV played the shit out of this. I know I'm a little older than you, so you probably you def you you know, you definitely missed it. But like in eighty seven, <laughs> like on Headbangers Ball, man, any one of these songs was fair game because there was a video for all of them because of the home video and, and, and they played them all on M T V and it was just a really big album. Even though it only went gold. I was I would I noticed that the other night, which they said was kinda of disappointing compared to what huh. you know what they thought was gonna happen. But anyways, coolest thing though. I love how they start with Out in the Cold. Because Out in the Cold yes. is like a slower type tune. It ain't really that heavy. So. Oh, boy. Sorry. It was my, no my kids hit my uh, alarm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I think Out in the Cold is, is a pretty cool starter. And everybody's on top form. And I think this has a lot of that studio magic. Even though Priest is great, like you listen to like Private Property or something like that, yes. there's just too many voices. And I know the crowd isn't doing that bad, <laughs> that chorus with them. <laughs> Not that good, you know what I mean? So there's some magic in there, but but it, it works. And it's a great album, and it, it gives you the feel of that show and that tour and all that stuff. So, yeah, awesome stuff. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say... The segue is perfect. We didn't plan it. And here's where I got Priest yeah. 87 live. <laughs> yeah. You know, all the same stuff you said, man. Recorded in 86, the coming up. My choice album of Turbo, which I know isn't everybody's choice. There's a lot of okay. it on there, yeah. A lot of it. Yeah. Uh, heavy Metal Parking Lot, that was <laughs> pre-show. That, that's cool. And it, it goes to show the buzz and the... The party fun surrounding this concert with Doc and opening, and what a cool time! But I mean, dude, the stage show, epic video, private property, Turbo Lover, parental guidance. We got it's just it's just so young, and and it's the place to be. And if you notice, there's a very female heavy audience here, and it's mm-hmm. a far cry from the early days of the the sweaty dudes that were there to see Priest do all the the pre Turbo stuff. Right. So. It's it's different, and I think it's probably because you know Dawkin was there, and Turbo came out and it had the synthesizers and whatnot. So it's very different for Priest, but I love it, dude. I was listening to Turbo the other day, and you know what? I'm so sick of everybody saying that it was like a sellout or a weak album. <laughs> Go back and listen to Living After Midnight or Heading Out on the Highway. How are these songs any different? I, I don't really. They're just modernized, but it's it's the same kind of simplicity simple fun catchy song so I, I don't see where maybe they weren't as heavy as like screaming for vengeance but if you go back to some of the earlier pre stuff there's early stuff that's corny and cheesy like like point of entry and all that stuff so i don't know man oh totally because i read an interview with those guys talking about how they went a little overboard on the synthesizer which they they may have but it worked well it was a little bit zz top eliminator at times with the the synthesizer but it's fine. It worked killer. And that's the only difference, exactly like you're saying, between the, the old priest and the 86 priest. Just a little bit of synthesizer. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, thank God you messaged me this album the other day because I would have forgot to put it on. And, and watch it now be at number three. But we got Ingve live in Leningrad. He's live in Russia, and he's got my boy singing Joe Lynn Turner. And like we've been saying, you get something different. You get to hear Joe Lynn do um, the trilogy stuff. Strangely, oh, yeah. there's nothing off of uh, Marching Out on here, which I thought was kind of weird. But I would have liked to hear Joe do I'll See the Light Tonight. I think he does do it. I, I, he's On that tour, for the Odyssey tour, he does play that, but it's not on this album for some reason. But I see. He, he sounds so cool, like on Queen Is In Love and You Don't Remember, I'll Never Forget. 
And we got a stellar band here. We got the Johansson brothers and and Ingve and Joe Lynn, and then some dude on bass that I don't know what his name is. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> well, he's cool too. He's a cool guy. But uh, but the, and the little little nugget on here is uh, the Hendrix cover, uh, Spanish Castle Magic. Uh, they do a great version of that, and uh, it's just a great album, man. So I, I, thanks for uh, reminding me of it because I might have skipped it. But uh, but it's a great <laughs> one, big big one for you know being an Ingve fan in that era. So. Yeah, dude, I don't imagine them skipping much of the stuff in the first two albums because even though Soto was a like a, a deeper, raspier guy, I could see Joe Lynn Turner kind of doing whatever he wants because he's such a talent. So um, I think that, yeah, you're you're right. They, they played it at some point, but it might not be on the album. Yeah. But, man, they, they, they definitely kind of um, cover all, all the grounds that you'd expect in that in that time frame from from Ingve. so yeah cool um, I, I like this one a lot and you know you made a good point too because you know when you think of joe lynn you kind of think of like pop pop rock type of stuff yeah. especially if you listen to like a solo album rescue you but that man you listen to him do do liar and queen is in love and it's it's total metal man he can sing metal he can sing anything so he he's the man oh totally that guy's the man he, yeah. he could probably still do it yeah i'm sure he can <laughs> all right number two Cool. Well, I, I did uh, kind of mix up my list here because originally uh, Priest was my number three, but I had to put Scorpions Worldwide Live as my yeah. number two from 85. So this is Scorps at their peak, you know, 85, California, San Diego, party vibe, what a time for them. And they just completely scorched it with the set list. They came out with Coming Home and Blackout, Bad Boys Running Wild, Loving You Sunday Morning, which is tough to do live, and they killed it. Big City Nights, Can't Live Without You, and a really cool instrumental six-string six sing. <laughs> Say that fast ten times. Um, Klaus sounded amazing as ever, and very cool double album with great artwork. Photos inside were so cool. Really cool fold-out LP. One of my favorite Scorpions albums, and it really got me going on these guys. So uh, this kind of set the tone in my early days for what a live album and a band should sound like in their heyday. So mm -hmm. love Scorps and I love this album. Yeah, you know, I loved this album when I was a kid. It was kind of like the gateway to the Scorpions. Like I bought this and then I bought Savage Amusement and then I went back and I bought all the uh, the earlier albums. But I don't know what happened. Over the years, I just kind of lost track of this album and I, I never listened to it. But I really need to go back and check it out because it was. It was kind of like my gateway album to the Scorps. So glad you put it on there, man. Very good. All right, number two. Long Beach Arena! They have returned for the final night of their 1986 87 World Tour! The most outrageous band in the world! Was that number two? No, I got I got that my number, number two. two. Yep. <laughs> okay. Your number two. My number two. Oh, I, I get to go now. All right, sweet. Uh, okay. So I got Wasp live in the Raw. Man, what a oh, band! Yeah, baby. Right? What a lineup! And rest in peace, Steve Riley. I think Steve is the the uh, MVP of this album. His drums just sound killer. Kind of like what I was talking about earlier. That makes the live album. It's that drum sound. It just sounds like you're at the concert. You know. And in interviews. I've read where he said that he's the only live thing on the album, right? That's what he said. Ooh, All right. ouch, I yeah. interviewed Johnny Rod. He said that it, 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 everything you hear is what they did. I don't know who to believe. Johnny, <laughs> I, I think, was pretty wasted, so I don't know if he remembers. But but um, <laughs> no matter what, if you go back and you watch videos from this tour, th these guys sound great. I mean, you got a great totally. lineup. you got Steve, Johnny, Chris Holmes, and Blackie. Mm -hmm. Johnny's a great singer in his own right. He can kind of sing like Blackie Lawless. But if you listen, Blackie is doubling himself in the studio. But it works, man. And when I was a little kid, I didn't really even know until, you know, when I got older, I kind of picked up on it. It's got all the classics. You're starting off with um, 
Inside the Electric Circus, into I Don't Need No Doctor, Love Machine, uh, I Want to Be Somebody. But the cool thing about this man is you got Blackie's stage raps. And at this point, I think Blackie was in his Paul Stanley phase. He kind of reminds me, you know, he almost acquires a southern accent at times when he's uh, when he's when he's talking live or whatever. But uh, it, it's really yeah. cool. He, he gets on a tirade talking about the PMRC. He um, he kind of reveals what people think WASP might stand for, and he says, "We are sexual perverts." He says, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. uh, "It's just I remember all those those lines and." And the most classic is the the guy, the announcer in the beginning. On the final night of the 1987-1986 World Tour. You know, it's just like you just weird stuff <laughs> that you remember and that is classic. And it's just good stuff, man. So it, it, that one is always going to be high, high, high on my list. Could have been number one, but come on, man. We all kind of know on my list who number one is going to be. Well, yeah, just like mine. But I got to say, <laughs> dude, 9-5 nine, nine, Nasty. I think we talked about That's it before. Cool. There, that yeah. song, I don't know what it is about that song on yep. this album, but dude, it cooks. I yep. love that one. It's probably because it's just so tongue in cheek and so killer. Yeah, but yeah. Wild I, Child I is on love, there. Wild Child. I mean, there's yeah, just so dude. many killer songs. Yeah. Yeah, and it's flanked by that. It's Wild Child, Ben Nine Five Nasty. So that that might be why I was so pumped on it. Yep. But dude, I God, I was so close to putting this one on here, but I didn't, and I'm stoked that you did. And wait, before we I'll leave this one, so they played two new songs live, and Johnny Rod said that they actually played them, Manimal and Harder Faster, and then you got a killer, killer, killer studio song, Scream Until You Like It, from Ghoulies 2. So the whole makeup is just a nice collection, man. Live in the raw. Oh, I oh, how could I forget talking about Paul Sabu? Yeah. Love that guy. <laughs> All right. I, know who, I already know who number one is, but you got to tell everybody. Well, dude, I, you know, I had to. If it's not Crocus, it's not Sammy, it's not Benny Hill, it's gotta be Ace. <laughs> it's gotta be ACBC. And I was really struggling between If You Want Blood, You Got It, live from 1978, and Live at Donington, which was released in 92. So, very tough choice for me. The one I was exposed to first was If You Want Blood because my brother had the tape. So I heard that a lot when I was growing up. My dad also had the album, which, credit to him, what a ripper. Um, the one I took ownership of and obsessed with the most was 92, 91, whatever you want to call it, Live Monsters of Rock, Live at Donington. So I'm going to go with that one. Mm -hmm. I, got the tapes, I, I got the tapes for Christmas that year. It came with an Angus dollar. I mean, dude, the memories I have of that album are so good. It was so early in my ACDC obsession and love, right after the Razor's Edge came out. I was so stoked on these guys. So I got to go with Donington, even though I love the Bon Scott era as well. Um, really great set list spanning the entire career. And they were just like, they're kind of peaking coming off the Razor's Edge 10 years after Back in Black. So. This one also had Metallica, Motley, Queensryche, and the Black Crows at the Donington Festival that year. So really cool lineup as well. Um, this album means a lot to me. It goes on and on and on and on. And it kind of sets the tone for bands that are playing exactly like you expect the album to hear. And the, the singer hits every note. The guitar player is a virtuoso and does you know, everything under the sun, including solos and whatnot. So I'm going to go with Donington, but um, obviously it's ACBC. <laughs> yeah, this is a good sounding album. I think, you know, it benefits from the time period that it came out. And, you know, a record label was willing to put a lot of money into ACDC, especially after the Razor's Edge. So, yeah, it's a good sounding yeah. album, good stuff. One thing I'll say, and this might piss some Bon Scott faithfuls off, but I think that If You Want Blood, You Got It Live was doctored because bon scott was a great singer i want to sound exactly like bon scott I, I wish i could he's amazing i love him um but you don't often hear bon hit the notes live listen to a whole lot of rosie on this album and in my latter years i realized that the Intro to Whole Lot of Rosie 
isn't what you've ever heard Bond do live. And it's got to be doctored. And I'm bummed about that, but it sounds killer. But, you know, I'm, I may be, like I said, I may be crucified by ACDC faithfuls, but listen to a whole lot of Rosie. I don't know that Bond could do that live, but he certainly did it in the studio. So it's up for your guys' discussion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who knows, man? I don't. I definitely don't know. Uh, so, for, <laughs> for my number one, okay. So, of course, I've got Kiss. Well, one thing I told myself, which I didn't tell any of you before the whole list started tonight, is I, I was like, no 70s albums, no unplugged albums. So the, really that made it so my whole list didn't have to be Kiss, right? So so <laughs> yeah. number one is Kiss. And actually, this is my favorite Kiss live album anyways, and it's Kiss Alive 3. It's one of the finest live moments for this band, especially tightness-wise. You can always go back and say, of course, Kiss with Peter and Ace in the 70s with the show is, is peak live Kiss visually, right? But I think when you want to get to like the sound, th- this rivals you know the, the tightness and the musicianship. It probably rivals what you hear on the first Kiss Alive album. But it's really good stuff, man. Paul is in top form vocally. Eric Singer is just a monster on the drums. Bruce Kulik is a killer. Gene is 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 always a constant. You know, he's he's pretty. He's just always there. He's he's always good. And uh, it's back to the heavy rendition, something we talked about on the, the, the Meltdown album by Priest. But Kiss is coming right. off Revenge, and they're doing everything a little bit more beefed up, and it sounds good. And you got a nice mix of music. You got stuff from Revenge. You got stuff from their 80s albums and their 70s albums, so that's cool. Uh, there's overdubs. You know, there's some weird shit. Bruce Kulik, when I had him on the podcast, he says... I was made for loving you. Now there's a cool, it's a cool metallic version of I was made for loving you where Paul sings it an octave higher. It sounds really good, but they never played it on that tour. They only did it on the sound check because um, I think the label wanted it on there. So, cause it wasn't on any, oh, other, interesting. it wasn't on any yeah. other live albums. Paul is definitely backing himself up. If you listen to like lick it up, you can hear him doing, uh, you know, the, the ad lib stuff along with the backups, which is impossible to do. You can't do that. You know? <laughs> uh, so there's yeah. definitely some shit piping in. But if you go back and you listen to, like, I watched a concert the other night in Miami from 92, and it sounds killer. It, it just, this is just, like I said, they just tightened it up, beefed it up a little bit, you know, made it sound good, pleasing to the ear. But uh, it's just a great, great album and will always be my favorite Kiss Alive, and uh, that's what I got. Cool, dude. Yeah, great era for that band. I can't I can't deny any of that. When We, we probably knew that. Both of our number ones were going to be our number ones, which was is is true to form. I love it. So, what do you got for ones that you almost made it? Ones that you didn't put on for a reason or, or whatever? What do what do you got? Yeah, dude, killer. I got Van Halen doing the the ninety one ninety two tour. I uh, love that home video. Uh, Queensrÿche doing um, Operation Mindcrime yep. live, which yep. is cool. The Slaughter L- or uh, EP, the Slaughter EP, stick it to you live was cool, but it's an EP, so whatever. Uh, Winger had one, and I had at Inve on there. Mm-hmm. Y&T had two great live albums. Pretty Maids had a good one. John Sykes had a good one. Britney Fox, I talked about in our two thousands episodes. They had a great one. Yep. Um, LA Guns, Wasp, uh, Def Leppard had in the round in your face home video which I'm absolutely spun up on. I've seen it 50 times over, but it never came out as an official album until recently, so I didn't incorporate it, but I love Def Leppard in around in your face. And then one I kicked off, which I don't remember which one I, I put in place of it, but it was Poison Swallow This Live. Mm-hmm. And I almost I almost put it, but then I, and then you and I talked about it, and I didn't think they performed very well. I don't no. know why, because I think I, I do preach Poison live. I think CC is is underrated, and like I said, I saw him on the la- on the stadium tour, and CC absolutely ripped it up. But live, then it didn't impress me. Even though the set list was really cool, 
I had it on there, like I said, but then I kicked it off. So Swallow This Live got booted to the honorable mention list. Yeah, Swallow This Live, um, I never bought it when it came out. The big selling point is So Tell Me Why, the studio track. I love yes. that. Yeah. Um, I think with Poison, and most people will agree, it's a high-energy band. It's great to watch visually, but if you're just going to sit and listen to that audio, it's probably not going to be – you'd rather listen to the studio stuff. There's, there's no right. doubt about it. Um, there's another Wasp album that I wanted to put on, or at least was an, for an honorable mention, is uh, Double Live Assassins. I think that's during the KFD mm-hmm. tour, and they sound really good. And it's they get to integrate like stuff like the Headless Children and the Real Me and all that kind of stuff. So so it, it's pretty cool, but uh, I didn't make the cut. I went back, man. I listened to the Motley Entertainment or Death, and it's just yeah. Vince just kind of ruins it. I mean, he's not horrible, horrible, and it's weird because those shows are from all different years. Like there's some there's stuff from like the early '80s, and then there's stuff from the '90s, and I don't know. It's just. He's just, he's like we said with Poison, he, you know, back, if you saw a crew, you know, like from like 84 to 90 or something like that, you saw a really cool high energy show, but you might not want to sit and listen to that audio. You know what I mean? It, it just, it wasn't there. Oh yeah. If, no, this is one I thought about today, but I, I figured, you know, we're really focusing on metal and this is not really metal, but man, I wanted to put some Queen on there. Uh, Queen Montreal. So if everybody, if anybody knows this show, it's from 1981. And it's one of the it's, it's it may be doctored a little bit too. Not that Queen can't do it; they can definitely do it. But it sounds so good. It just sounds too good. And I think it's going to come out on Disney Plus, like an IMAX. So I can't. That's May fifteenth, <laughs> I think. So I'm going to be watching that because that's an amazing, amazing, amazing live performance. But um, Live Killers by Queen is also good. I wanted to put the Alice Cooper one from the seventies. I didn't do that. I would have probably put Kiss Alive and Kiss Alive too as well. But. Uh, I, I stayed away from the seventies and, and tried to just stay like straight up eighties and nineties metal. So that's that's about all I got. That's great. Um, the Motley thing, I totally agree, dude. I was close to doing Entertainment of Death, but not only was it a weird combination of all their different eras, it just it, it wasn't that great. You know, Motley yeah. seeing Motley on the Doctor Feelgood tour, or like you got to do on the 87 tour, which I'm yeah. highly jealous of. Yeah. Um, it would have been really cool to see they were peaking. But yeah, listening to it now, I, I got the album when it came out. I know that the Theater of Pain was going to be called Entertainment of Death. It's a song lyric, blah, blah, blah. But it just never did it for me, and I, I was never that stoked on it. So uh, I I like that you mentioned it, but um, I'm more stoked that you mentioned Heavy Metal Rambo because that's what I'm really focused on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right, man. Well, always good chatting with you, and uh, I'm glad we did the live albums. It was definitely long overdue. Totally, man. That was great. And you got me mocked all death tonight. He's a heavy metal <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> all right, brother. Have a good one. All right, man. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see you. Yeah.